Kia ora everyone and welcome. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Fuchsia Goldsmith and I am a plant-based dietitian based here in Tamaki, Makoto, Auckland. Um, so today we are hosting our monthly Vegan for Vitality live um, and today's topic is going to be on how a vegan diet can help with cardiovascular health. And we thought that this was a really important question uh, that had been asked um, from the audience uh, and we really wanted to prioritize this conversation especially today on Father's Day because we know that heart disease is something that disproportionately uh, does affect uh, men although obviously uh, it's something that has a massive impact on all of our friends, families, etc. because uh, it's so common here in New Zealand. So today I will be joined by Dr. Luke Wilson uh, and as you may have heard in the previous lives, uh, he is a plant-based GP based in Wellington uh, and he's got a lot of experience um, helping people to unlock better health through plant-based nutrition and a wealth of experience, especially in the cardiovascular health space. So he is really the perfect person Person to be talking to uh, with today's topic on um, the link between a vegan diet and heart health. So without further ado, uh, I will bring Dr. Luke Wilson on, so just bear with me. Okay. How is that going? Is that invite popping up, Luke? Ah, perfect. Sure. <laughs> Welcome, Luke. It's so great Let's to have you here today. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, just seeing if I can get my camera sorted, but there we go. Looks okay to me now. Yeah. Yeah, I can see you can okay. You, can you hear me end. okay? Yeah, I can. Cool. It's a little Perfect. bit more muffled, but um, I can definitely hear what you're saying. So I think right. we're okay. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Um, so Luke, would you like to uh, get us started by telling us a little bit about what heart disease is? I feel like it's a term that's used uh, so so frequently, um, and I think a lot of people really struggle with actually what is heart disease. Yeah, it's a little bit muffled from your end actually too, but I, I, I've got I've got the gist of what you've what you've asked. So, heart disease. Technically, if we think about heart disease, then that could actually be just about any kind of disease of the heart. So usually when people talk about heart disease, what they're referring to is the most common form, which is either called coronary heart disease or ischemic heart disease. And that's the one that's associated with heart attacks. And so that's usually what we think of. Obviously other heart diseases could be anything from you know congenital heart disease. So problems with your heart that you're born with, uh, rheumatic heart disease, which is unfortunately quite a big problem in New Zealand and all the way to anything like uh, pericarditis or myocarditis, which has received a bit more attention of, of um, later times. But usually we make the distinction between, we use, we use the term cardiovascular disease, and that starts to be more about any disease that affects the cardiovascular system per se, and that tends to be diseases that particularly affect the the blood vessels and that really encompasses ischemic heart disease but then that also would include strokes and uh, arguably as well dementia now um, or certainly vascular dementia but also alzheimer's dementia we're learning more and more seems to be associated with what's going on as far as your cardiovascular risk factors are concerned and even, even things like uh, sexual dysfunction. And uh, then we've also got uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, which is when you're getting pain in your legs, for example, or your calves, muscles when you're walking and so forth. So the reason that I make that distinction is because really there's uh, those, the cardiovascular diseases that I've just talked about have a lot in common so they, they basically have the same causation and that's what we're going to be probably focusing in on most today. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big umbrella that really does encompass quite a wide range of, um, of conditions there, yeah. Mm. 
and mm -hmm. and as you said, it's actually it's a very very common condition, uh, ischemic heart disease particularly. So heart attacks uh, will, well, about one in twenty people in New Zealand is affected by heart disease, and one person every ninety minutes or so, according to the Heart Foundation, will die mm -hmm. from um, heart disease, and a lot of those deaths are preventable. So that's that's really what we want to be addressing. Yeah, and I think when we talk about these statistics, like it's so important to bring them into like a real life context because I think it's easy to think, oh, this many and this many, but it's really hard to process those sorts of numbers. Um, oh, no. <laughs> like, like if you think about it, like think about you and your two best friends, like probably one of you will end up with heart disease. And that's wild. Like if we think about it in those in those sorts of terms, like that's how how frequent it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is also the number one cause of death. So when you look at the numbers online, oftentimes people will say, actually, no, it's cancer. But it, to me, it's silly to lump cancers all into one category because they have quite different causations and they're in different parts of the body. And so, for example, that's, that would be including melanomas along with bowel cancers, along with lung cancers. And we know, for example, that the majority of lung cancers that we see in New Zealand are caused by cigarette smoking, and then the majority of melanomas will be caused by excessive sun exposure and so forth. And then bowel cancers are interesting, but again, that's probably uh, largely mm -hmm. dietary as well. So that's maybe something we'll talk about in the, in the yeah, future. Yeah, possibly a topic for, a, mm. for another live, because I think, yeah, we could definitely talk a lot about that as well. <laughs> yeah, but, but when you actually look at the numbers, uh, ischemic heart disease is number one, or, you know, number two behind cancer. And then number three is cerebrovascular disease, which again is, is your strokes, which we've just talked about, are basically all caused by the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing to sort of remember here is that the, um, there is a lot that we can modify uh, to actually affect um, rates of these diseases. So things, I mean, I mean, to put it bluntly, things like car accidents, you know, we can improve road safety, but there's, there's likely going to be a certain number of those regardless of, of what happens. Whereas I think with um, cardiovascular health and, and with cancers as well, um, there's mm. so much power to um, actually reduce those rates through um, lifestyle and nutrition. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Luke, would you like to run us through sort of what the main risk factors are for heart disease? Yeah, so, so the main risk factors really, if we were going to simplify it, I'd sort of put them into two categories. And the first one is cholesterol. And that's really from, I've, I've done a huge amount of reading and research on this over the years that in fact, it was really heart disease that got me very interested in plant-based nutrition in the first place and so over the last sort of 10 to 12 years or so this has really been a passion of mine and something that I've looked into a lot and so what seems to be the case is is that cholesterol is really the most important factor um, and and if you don't have the a high enough level of cholesterol you, if, then you, you simply can't have ischemic heart disease it's as simple as that so it's it's an it's a necessary uh, but not sufficient factor if you like so basically everything else I would put into the category of things that you know this is probably a little bit of an oversimplification but for you know the purposes of today I would say everything else sort of falls into the category of things that cause inflammation because we know that in addition to having you know cholesterol circulating around the body uh, the the thing that causes it to to uh, end up getting stuck in the artery walls and so forth mm -hmm. is probably large and, and to, to 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 cause you issues is probably due to other factors that can cause inflammation so other risk factors in that case become fairly obvious and it is things like smoking but that having been said, if you have a very, very low level of cholesterol, then even smoking won't necessarily be enough. And a perfect example of this are the, the Papua New Guinea Highlanders who have a tradition of, uh, of, of uh, 
basically smoking huts or something like that. And so they spent a lot of time in these basically smoking and they have virtually non-existent cardiovascular disease because they have very, very low levels of, of the cholesterol. So yeah, so smoking, um, exercise obviously is going to be helpful. Um, and that's also, you know, probably helpful uh, with modifying both of those factors because it's going to reduce your inflammation over the long term. And it's also going to help with your lipid metabolism as well. So those, those are really important factors. But you can go anywhere from, you know, you could, you could start saying, well, you know, your sleep quality is probably going to make a difference. And even things as seemingly unrelated as your stress levels and your connection with, you know, family, friends, and the rest of your community probably makes a difference too. So there's, there's a number of things. And what I would say as well is the really interesting thing with, with cardiovascular disease and what we fail to see in medicine, unfortunately with it, is that your, it's your cumulative exposure to this over time that really matters. So we were talking a little bit about it in our um, pre uh, discussion messages future that unfortunately we have data showing that basically heart disease can start in utero and very, very young children can have fatty streaks developing already. So it's, it starts very early in life. And so this, this is the big part of the issue. I, I, just, I just mentioned sort of like a stacking effect, isn't it? It's not just sort of what you're doing um, in this in this moment. It's that cumulative, um, that long-term build-up sort of through your diet as well. 100%. And, and this, this sort of comes back to, because really the best thing that you can do to, in order to know what your risk is and in order to be making some changes to, to move yourself away from the, the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or any of these other conditions that I, that I mentioned under um, cardiovascular disease is to be knowing what your numbers are and, and getting things like your blood pressure and cholesterol checked, for example. But How often would you recommend that people check their um, cholesterol and their blood pressure? How often? Hmm. So I think really you want to start, you want to start early and probably with cholesterol and blood pressure, these are two things that basically that they're not going to change a huge amount unless you make changes. And that's the whole point of them, right? And so uh, you really want to be getting them checked at a time when you, when things are fairly stable in your life and so that you know what it generally is. So if you go and then make some really good dietary changes over a couple of weeks or something, your cholesterol will change. It will be different at the end of that couple of weeks. So doctors think generally that it doesn't change much, but the reason for that is that people tend not to change much. And so, Very true, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that can be a really big motivating factor as well. If you are mm. wanting to make changes in your diet, it's important to have ways of, of measuring your success as well. Because um, it can, you know, it can be really easy to get disheartened when you may not necessarily um, outwardly notice a difference. But um, yeah. yeah, it can make a massive difference to your inner health as well. And, and that's the thing too. So, so coming back to just quickly the the lung cancer example. So one of the issues that we have, and this is across the world, this isn't just in New Zealand, but what will happen is if you're younger, then your GP likely won't even offer that test because we are encouraged to start checking and thinking about people's risk in terms of what their 10 year risk is. Now, remember that I said, this is, this is the result of accumulative exposure over your lifetime. And so the time when that tends to start being an issue for people is in their 50s and 60s, right? But, you know, sometimes younger nowadays, uh, and that's, that's, that's really unfortunate when that happens. But for most people, and it will be, you know, their 40s, 50s, 60s, when the GP starts becoming interested in this. And then what they'll do is they'll look at your 
cholesterol and your blood pressure, and they'll calculate what your 10-year risk is. Now, the problem with that is that the main risk factor, of course, when something's building up over time, is going to be your age. So if you're in your 40s, it pretty much doesn't matter you know, what your cholesterol and what your blood pressure is. They're going to say, oh, no, it's okay. You've got a very low 10-year risk. But if we think about the lung cancer example, if I knew you were smoking in your 20s, and it's the same, it's the same deal with lung cancer, is you, you're unlikely to get lung cancer in your 20s, even if you smoke a pack a day from your teens. So does it make sense for me as a doctor to say to you, well, look, I've worked out that in 10 years' time, you're unlikely to have a lung cancer, so keep on smoking, and we'll think about this again when you're in your 40s or 50s. And so this is the, this is the whole problem with medicine, right? And so this is, I think, extremely unfair to patients because it really makes a difference what you're doing now. And the longer that you're able to keep your cholesterol particularly, but also your blood pressure, and these things tend to move in the same direction when you make the same kinds of changes anyway. As long, the longer that you can keep those low, the, the lower your chances over your lifetime. And you're not going to have that, you know, for, for a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, I forget the exact statistics, but I think it's even like one in two or one in three. The first kind of sign that they have of a heart attack is a heart attack. And, and that, can be, that can be fatal in, in, a, in a number of cases. Mm, yeah. A high proportion. Yeah. So get it checked. Get, get your cholesterol <laughs> checked. <laughs> yeah and like I guess and like as I think anyone would agree with this like we want to go mm. more than 10 years without a heart attack <laughs> it's yeah. a pretty low bar <laughs> um, it, it really yeah it is yeah yeah and especially as um, you know people are living longer you know this is becoming more and more of a consideration as you mm. know, we're, we're wanting to protect our health long term <laughs> yeah and, and it also ignores the number of other conditions you know so I often see men in their 40s with sexual dysfunction, for example, and that's one of the first signs of, of uh, having you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and, and basically the plaque that's building up is just building up in other places, and that's what's mm -hmm. causing that condition. So, yeah, we, we often see those kinds of issues or, you know, later on down the track. A stroke mm -hmm. or um, Alzheimer's is not, not a good outcome for people either. So there's, there's a number of different conditions that you can prevent by, by making sure that your cholesterol levels are in the right range. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I just want to take a little step back from this as well um, and just acknowledge the fact that um, when it comes to heart disease, you know, there are um, movable risk factors and there are non-movable risk factors and so like if you are aware that you have some of these non-movable risk factors um then it's sort of extra important that you are sort of prioritizing this as well so i guess in terms of those non-movable risk factors like we know that um, there are certain ethnicities that are higher risk of having heart disease we know that as you get older um your risk of heart disease goes up um mm. and yeah, and also, like, if you've got a family history of heart disease, then that can play a, a big role in, in, in your risk as well. Um, are there any others that you would acknowledge as well there, Luke, in terms of non Well, uh, the, the, the main one would be the familial hypercholesterolemia, mm -hmm. and these are people who have very, very high levels of cholesterol from, you know, when they're very young. And so, you know, obviously you want to make all the dietary changes that you can, but the, the really interesting thing, again, about, about the cholesterol is that basically the lower, the better, and for the, for the longer amount of time, the better as well. And so these people will be on statins pretty much their whole life, but just because you're on a statin doesn't mean that you can't get the, you can't get the cholesterol even lower by making some really healthy dietary changes and that you also can't achieve you know, some, some other really useful health effects from, say, extra exercise or, you know, the, the, the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effects of, say, a, a plant-based or, or vegan diet are also very, very important, I think, in the, yeah. in the etiology of, of heart disease and in reducing your risk factors. So anyone who had those, then definitely. And, and for the groups that you've just mentioned as well, and I think a lot of that, again, comes back to this cumulative exposure 
and um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've talked, we've kind of alluded a little bit to the fact that um, we, we do both share um, that, that knowledge and um, acknowledgement that our plant-based diet or vegan diet does help a lot with heart disease. Um, I guess the question has been put forward. Um, do you feel that heart disease can be reversed? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it, I mean, there's, there's different definitions of what that might mean. And so for most people, really what they care about is, is reversing their symptoms. And what we do see, which is really, really neat, is people who have angina. So angina is basically, if you start getting a buildup in, your, in the arteries that lead to your heart, then that plaque can get enough that there's not enough blood able to flow through the blood vessel anymore. And so when you, you, you really notice this, especially when you're exercising, because when you're exercising, then you, the heart beats faster. And so it needs to have more blood flow going to it. And so if that can't happen, then you'll start getting some chest pains at exercise. And sometimes this can even get bad enough that people are getting this, you know, with, doing as simple things as like shaving or like walking out to the mailbox and sometimes even they'll get this at rest and so what we actually see within weeks with a change to a plant-based eating pattern in terms of you know what Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish or Nathan Pritikin would recommend which tends to be one that's also low in fat which reduces the cholesterol as quickly and as um probably as as well as you can as you can manage over a short period of time uh, they you know with, within a few weeks they are getting less of those pains or they go away altogether so that's that's sort of one definition of reversal another one is and this is where it starts to get more controversial is whether once you have these plaques they can actually start to regress and I would say from, from the evidence that I've looked at, you know, we can certainly see in Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Ornish's research and probably anyone who's watched Forks Over Knives will have seen the, the really neat pictures that appear to show reversal. Uh, you know, there's, there's been some controversy. <laughs> I don't know why, um, because it's like within the plant-based movement, it seems like we just want to um, sometimes debate amongst ourselves um, rather than sort of think about the bigger picture so much but there has been some debate about whether that actually constitutes proper reversal and whether the plaques are actually sort of melting away as you might assume and whether that matters is is a whole different story uh, but unfortunately from you know from un unfortunately i say because you know i'd rather that we weren't doing a lot of research in animals but we do know from animal studies that this does happen. So to me, again, I'm not really one for sort of human exceptionalism. And so to me, if we manage to see plaque progression and reversal in animal species, um, particularly primates, I would also assume that the same thing can happen in humans. It may depend on how long it's been there for. It may depend on you know what stage it's at, whether it's calcified or not. But I would say you know, I, I would put a lot on the fact that it's it's reversible. And we have seen reverse reversal with less controversial um, methods of imaging with statins, for example. And so if statins, basically all they do is lower the cholesterol. There's nothing magical about them, uh, much as your cardiologist might disagree. But um, they, they certainly, you, you can do it with lowering the cholesterol low enough. So yeah, it's it's reversible as as the short answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, and I think like if we could put a vegan diet into a pill, <laughs> mm -hmm. it would. That'd be the easiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would solve a lot of problems. But obviously, mm. you know, um, to make that sort of transition is is a process. It's um, something that's very difficult to do overnight, and it does take time and dedication and and thought. Um, and perhaps even working with someone as well to just sort of help iron yeah. out um, that process uh, and make sure that you're, you're getting everything that you need. Um, yeah, so, mm. it, 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 it certainly can be, but as, as um, if anyone's seen Grant Dixon's documentary, The Big Fat Lie, um, a heart attack can be a very strong motivator. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so, so some people do manage to make that change very rapidly 
and if, and are interested in doing that after they've had, you know, a, a heart attack or a, a stroke or you know they've developed angina, and I think it's one of the scariest things that you can go through. Definitely, and so I can't blame them at all. And and in those situations, I think there really is is a, a good argument to be made for getting onto it as quickly as possible. And even in those situations, it is about bringing the cholesterol down as quickly as possible for as long as possible and so in those situations yeah you know take the statin initially until you get your diet and everything all sorted and then if it's if it's low enough um then then perhaps come off it um but otherwise you know if, if it's not causing you any harm and it's keeping your cholesterol in, in the in the right range um that you need for reversal which we think is probably less than an ldl of about less than 1.4 uh to to get regression but the interesting thing about that too is it seems other factors are involved because with what dean ornish was able to show he the ldl cholesterol of his patients i believe averaged out about 2.35 and they still seem to show about three percent regression or at least what we thought was three percent regression and the number of uh, cardiac events reduced by two and a half times so yeah, there's, there's definitely, there's perhaps a little bit more to it than just lowering the cholesterol. And I'd argue probably that comes from the fact that in Dr. Ornish's research, they made a number of lifestyle changes, including the healthy diet. Whereas when we look at these 1.8 and 1.4, so 1.8 being the stage, the LDL number that we think it doesn't progress anymore from. So it sort of stops accumulating. Um, and 1.4, thinking about where the regression might be, if all you're doing is just giving someone a medication and they're still eating the same diet and they're still continuing the same lifestyle and we're driving those numbers low enough, then it stands to reason to me that those numbers would need to be lower than someone who's actually got um, other lifestyle changes going on that can be beneficial, as was the case in Ornish's research. Mm, yeah, that's absolutely right. Like, you can't... You can't mimic everything in a pill that you would get from um, changing changing your nutrition and, and not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people yeah. are working on it, but yeah, for now at least. <laughs> yeah, so I guess to dive into that a little bit more, um, mm. we've kind of touched the surface. I think of like how a vegan diet is helpful for people with heart disease. But yeah, um, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit more for us? Uh, well, as I, as I was saying, so a vegan diet. The research shows maybe a 25 to, you know, about a quarter to a third reduction in cardiovascular events and mortality for a vegan which or vegetarian huge. diet, which, yeah, which is massive. We so, I mean, again, if we're... Significant if, if, findings in, yeah. in research, so, yeah, yeah it's just massive. <laughs> it is. So, if we had, again, if we had a pill that would do that, uh, then then that would be very, uh, very so useful. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so it's definitely it's definitely worth doing. If yeah, and I guess the the thing with that is, well, what about the rest? You know, the, the other sort of seventy percent or so. And so that's where I think if you're really trying to make sure that your your risk of of cardiovascular disease and a whole host of other diseases as well as, as as low as possible that's when you start needing to think about um, other lifestyle changes as well and also um, potentially like a whole food plant-based way of eating that is you know styled similarly to ornish esselstyn and and pritikin where it is lower in fat mm. and the other thing too i I'd, I'd just mentioned Oh, sorry. Just to go back one step, because I'm just mindful that um, possibly uh, not everyone watching this video will be familiar with a whole food plant-based diet and, mm. and the definition of it. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so a whole food plant-based diet, it's really what it sounds like. So it means a plant-based diet. So you're not including any animal products. And of course, you are including, you know, by the part of it that says whole you're really trying to make sure that your foods are as unprocessed as possible and as close to to what you would find in nature or grow in 
So that means, you know, apples instead of apple sauce or apple juice most of the time. Um, it means whole grains instead of processed grains. And that's, that's basically it. So it's based on uh, fruits and vegetables um, and whole grains and legumes would be the main things. Yeah, no, it's a really good description. Thanks, mm. Luke. And, and that's, that's where we come back to a little bit around, you know, when we look at vegetarian and vegan diets and, and the difference that they can make is that you can have, and again, we were talking about this a little bit before too in your messages, there's, there's a, especially nowadays, uh, is that there's a wide variety of how healthful a vegetarian or, or vegan diet can be. And so they've actually found, you know, that they've started using this index in some of the research called the, I think it's like the HPDI or something like that, Healthy Plant-Based Diet Index. And so they look at, you know, is your plant-based diet full of refined grains and sugars and that kind of thing? Um, and it's essentially a measure of diet quality. Exactly. That, that's exactly what it is. And so when they start looking at that, well, actually, sometimes uh, the, the vegetarian or vegan diet actually doesn't look as good for heart disease. There's no difference or it can even be worse. So that's worth keeping in mind. The other thing we should keep in mind when we look at these things as well, again, going back to, and this is going to be a recurring theme, is if you're if you're looking at vegetarians and vegans, and this goes for any research you see done on vegetarians and vegans, is you have to ask, how long have they actually been vegetarian and vegan for? And a lot of the time, the studies don't necessarily make any distinction between this. And so if we're talking about cardiovascular disease, which is something that accumulates over your lifespan, then we would obviously expect someone who's been vegetarian since, you know, since they were, were a kid, um, to have much better outcomes to someone who's become vegetarian in the last five years or so when we look at heart disease. And so I would say that those numbers are a definite underestimate of what's possible, even with a, you know, with a vegetarian or, or a vegan diet, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm. What is really encouraging to see, though, is I do think there has been a lot more um, interest and in, um, research energy put into this topic, especially around whole food, plant-based and, and vegan diets. And yeah, I was you may have seen it on my story recently, but um, Massey University up here in Auckland is doing a mm -hmm. study on the um, long-term health of vegans as well. So it is really cool to see that there is um, that sort of shift uh, in the way that we are approaching uh, vegan vegan nutrition and whole food plant-based diets. So it will be really exciting to see sort of as we step, um, as we step forward, what the results of um, the new research uh, will be as well. Yeah, no, definitely. But keep, keep that in mind because again, I don't know what their research design is like, but it matters how long people have been. And the other thing too that we often see is people, you know, people change because they have a health scare or someone in their family has heart disease. And so that's why they choose to become vegetarian or vegan or, you know, as, as we talked about before, Grant. So he became, you know, whole food plant-based after his heart attack. And so is it fair to then look at someone who's, you know, from the rest of their life hasn't been vegan or vegetarian and say, well, this is the risk um, when we know that that risk has already accumulated over the rest of their lifespan when they weren't vegetarian or vegan. So it'd be really interesting. For yeah, and I guess the acknowledging of that as well, like if, yeah, like you say, um, I guess um, if you've had a major health scare, um, mm. yeah, uh, people are more likely to sort of make that, make that change. And I guess yeah. if you have those health conditions, uh, that's quite different. Um, that's, yeah, we need to sort of match that too. The general population yeah. as well we yeah. need to compare apples with apples and pears with pears <laughs> yeah 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 because yeah. that's the thing chronic chronic diseases don't develop overnight they develop over time and mm -hmm. so yeah and exactly like what you were saying with the smoking example is um you know we wouldn't mm. we wouldn't ignore how long someone had been smoking <laughs> if yeah. we were conducting research so it's really important that we're considering that in terms of vegan diet definitely but i will be interested to see and that's great news that they're doing that kind of research now yeah yeah but i don't Absolutely. need to see <laughs> that's the thing Sorry. <laughs> but yeah. i don't need to see that's the thing and i think this this is this comes back to a lot of it as well because 
when we talk about, for example, what, um, you know, Dr. Esselstyn and, and, and those guys have achieved, so the, the argument is, oh, yes, but that was a small study and we need more research. And it's like, that's fine, but who's going to do the research? And, you know, as, as far as I know, there's nothing mass, massive going on. So, and, and, and same with, with, with plant-based diets, you know, just because the research isn't there yet, um, we can still make some fairly good assumptions based on what we already know and the, the, basically the totality of the evidence that's pointing in this direction and then say, well, okay, you know, it might not be 100% the most absolute perfect way to do things, but it's the best way we know of at the moment. So why don't we do the best way that we know of at the moment, see how we go with that, and, you know, like, like um, T. Colin Campbell says, probably we could get rid of 80% of chronic disease, you know, and, and Dr. Esselstyn is pretty convinced we could get rid of almost 100% of heart disease. And that would just be a massive gain. And, and maybe it's not perfect. And maybe we would find actually, you know, we could get an extra percentage here and there if we did this other thing, or maybe something else needs to be included, or maybe some omega-3s or whatever it is. I don't know. But um, it's, it makes sense to start from where you are. Mm. And very few things in research. life are perfect. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if we're, if we're going to hold out and wait for that magic bullet that's going to um, like absolutely solve everything with little effort and no yeah. risks, um, we could be waiting for a very long time and lose a lot of people in the process. Exactly, so it's exactly. Really act with and, the knowledge that we have today. And that's, and that's the problem. It, is, it, as a doctor, I'm seeing people who need this help now, you know, and, and you'll be seeing that too. As, as a dietitian, so we don't see people who need help in 10 years time when there's more research we mm. see people who need help at the moment so we have to act on what we have and to me it's unethical for anyone who has heart disease or a family history of it to, for them not to know at least about you know what what we can tell from the research we have into whole food plant-based nutrition in this at this point even though it's certainly not perfect and also, but if you if you add that to what we can see from populations around the world who don't have heart disease, then to me that becomes very compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to develop on from this as well. Um, like we've talked about, like a lot of heart disease potentially being able to be prevented um, by a plant based diet or vegan diet. Um, can you still get heart disease if you follow a vegan diet? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think we kind of alluded to this before with the with the healthy plant based dietary index and index of dietary quality. And so certainly, I believe that you do a lot of things in the right direction just by becoming plant based. And there's certainly it's not. It's not just the case of plants being good it's also a case of animal products actually being quite inflammatory and harmful and for, for many reasons and containing dietary cholesterol and tending to contain saturated fat of the kind that will raise our cholesterol so that's there's, there's certainly something to be said and, and even when they've looked at uh, what was it called oh the swap meat study for example which was funded i think by was it um it must have been beyond burger <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but but they they compared a Beyond Burger to a I think it was a grass fed, you know, mm. all these kinds of things, organic beef burger, and people eating the Beyond Burger had better cardiovascular, you know, risk factors. So, just the fact of actually removing the animal product actually had a positive effect, and so I think that that's really important. But at the same time, can you be plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, and still have a high cholesterol over your lifetime? And even once you become vegetarian or plant-based, you definitely can. And that's something that would need to be addressed. And that might mean that there's, there's specific changes that you can make to your diet. Um, or it might mean that there's you know, other specific changes that you can make to your lifestyle. But I would tend to say in the situations where that happens, it tends to be because people um, are probably, it's, it's pretty easy, I would say. The, the average New Zealander, I don't know if you remember the stats off the top of your head, Fuchsia, but I think our average fat intake 
is probably around the 30 to 35 percent and so that means that our taste buds are kind of adapted to that right and so when we flip over to a plant-based diet if we keep those numbers about the same you're definitely going to cut your saturated fat intake down but are you going to cut your saturated fat intake down below the sort of five to seven percent which is a recommendation of the heart association and also which is going to drop your cholesterol enough to get to some of those numbers that we talked about earlier i mean that's that's really going to depend on other factors in your lifestyle and things like that but probably not uh, you probably need to be looking at a lower fat version of a plant-based eating pattern mm -hmm. and i'd like to just sort of take a step back as well and just sort of acknowledge the fact that you know heart disease is something that is so common in our communities and um you know simply by by that nature as well like just by chance like um looking at that like it's it is absolutely possible that that people on a vegan diet can develop heart disease and um that's not to say that um following a nutritious vegan diet um, is not still doing benefits um, to mm. your heart disease risk and um, to all of those factors that we've talked about today yeah and there's, there's things that you can't so you can't control for example what your mum ate during pregnancy or what you had mm. you know when you're a child and everything in our, in our environment is pushing us towards a dietary pattern which is really high and and um, processed and you know, ultra processed and fat foods. That's most of what we see at the supermarket. And it also tends to be, you know, like I said, our, our taste buds are adapted more for things that are higher in fat and, and higher in saturated fat. And that's that's one of the things when you go back to the the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger, for example, in order to imitate the taste of real meat, what they need to do is they need to put saturated fat in there and so they've done that but they've done that with coconut oil instead and so co coconut oil and palm oil particularly uh, are, are things that um, people who are plant-based should really be looking to i would say looking to limit because they are high in saturated fat and the, and the heart foundation's already done research on this they, they commissioned yeah, something really a few great, years ago great paper on it yeah mm. yeah Cool. Um, is there anything else that you would like to sort of share about um, a vegan diet and, and heart health, Luke? Not really. <laughs> yeah. I guess I if guess. you could share one message, um, like, yeah, if you could, if you could, like, put a billboard up <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for all of New Zealand to see, um, mm -hmm. what, what would your message be um, around heart health? Regarding heart health, I, I think that pe everyone has to watch Forks Over Knives. And you have to see what, you know, some of those testimonies, I know that that's obviously not randomized controlled data, but from Dr. Esselstyn's patients are just so powerful. And seeing the changes that it's made in people's symptoms, but also looking at the scans. Remember it when we were up with Hannah at the, um, the GP conference in Rotorua and someone stole our picture that we had um, <laughs> I think it was the only thing that got stolen from our stall but we had a print out of like some of Dr Esselstyn's angiography and I think one of them might have also been a picture of the blood flow to the heart um, on on um, I forget positive on attrition uh, emission tomography or, or, or MRI I can't remember because um, I'm not a cardiologist but anyways so wh whatever it was um, someone found it compelling enough or, or um, controversial enough that they decided that they would take it with them so um, we, we lost that to show people for the rest of the conference so I think there's there's some real uh, benefit to people in knowing that this is I mean Dr Esselstyn essentially calls this a foodborne illness and mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to ruffle a few feathers or, you know, be, be a bit controversial. But I think it's not a bad way for us to, to start to look at this. I'm trying to remember something, something I read when I was preparing for this is, is about in Finland. Um, you might know the study. They, the Finland used to have like the highest rate of, of cardiovascular disease or ischemic heart disease in the world. And a particular region of Finland, um, North Karelia or something like that. I, I probably butchered that one. But um, so 
they, they actually decided that they would have a public health intervention where they would try and get people to reduce their blood pressure and they would try and get people to um, stop smoking. And one of the things that they did, did was, was cut the saturated fat intake. And what they actually found is that the saturated fat intake almost cut in half. So they went from about 22% down to about 13%. And the cardiovascular disease mortality uh, dropped by 80%. And that is despite the fact that smoking rates pretty much didn't change and that people actually got more overweight. Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting um, observation, you know, is, mm. is that, yeah, I, I think people need to know that this is something that we really do have a lot of control over in most cases. We've talked about some of the cases where there might be less control over it. And I think it's also important that people don't, um, don't beat themselves up too much about, you know, what the risk might be now or what might've happened in the past, but it's, it's good for them to be able to have a way forward where they feel like they can really take some control over this. And, and that's, that's one of the most rewarding things for me as a, as a GP is when people feel like they're, they're able to make some changes and, and sort of have some, I suppose, authority over, over which direction things are going to move in for them. And, and sometimes you do all you can and that's not enough, um, but at least you've, you've done your best and, and, and then maybe we have medications or, or other things that we can help with. Yeah, and they don't need to be um, mutually exclusive. These two things no. can be absolutely used together and, and may be appropriate um, as the best solution for you. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't benefit from um, following a nutritious vegan diet. <laughs> Definitely. I, I, I always emphasise that to patients is that if, if I do end up prescribing them a medication, it's not, it's, it's not a replacement for mm. the lifestyle changes, you know. Um, so as we talked about earlier with the, with the cholesterol, it seemed like the participants in Dr. Ornis's research really got a lot of benefit from the other things they were doing, as well as just the, the LDO lowering itself. Mm, yeah, I'm just noticing we've had a question come through and if anyone mm -hmm. else has questions, please do drop them in the comments box. Um, so we just had a question, are there any nutrients uh, that are beneficial to heart health that are typically lower on a vegan diet? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. What do you think, Fuchsia? Okay. Yeah, um, I guess my, um, I'm struggling to think of any particular nutrients, mm. but we do know that um, <clears throat> particularly like uh, your potassium intake is really tightly linked to your cardiovascular yeah. health and a vegan diet is typically much higher in potassium exactly. than um, other dietary patterns. Uh, so when well balanced, I think that's a key point is, um, you know, we're talking about a high quality vegan diet mm. uh, where you do have a balance um, between the different food groups and predominantly plant-based. Um, if you are eating predominantly plant-based, um, you're likely to be getting all of the nutrients that your body needs um, because yeah. you're eating real food. Um, whereas like if the diet quality isn't quite the same, you there is that increased risk of um, maybe being a little bit short in certain nutrients. So I think that would sort of be my, my main take on, on that point. But do you yeah. have any other thoughts you'd like to yeah, share? Yeah, just, just while you were talking, uh, I just remembered that B12 is, 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 is important. Um, and so... Um, because of homocysteine levels, and so those can start rising if you don't have enough B12, and so that's also related to heart disease risk. So certainly make sure that you're taking your B12 supplement, and we did talk about this <laughs> quite extensively <laughs> a few few months ago now in our first yeah, discussion. Yeah, like the recording of that. Um, it's on uh, it's on my Instagram page, and it's also dropped in the Vegan for Vitality Facebook group, so you can find that. Um, I'll try and tag it in the um, comments so that it's nice and easy to find. Yeah, and, and other than that, yes, potassium is really important. That's one of the reasons that we think blood pressure is so much lower on a, on a vegan diet or plant-based diet. So... In, the opposite side of that is um, sodium, so that also should be lower. But again, 
that's an interesting one because one of the main complaints that's been thrown at the plant-based meats is that they are quite high in sodium. And so, and, and that's, that would be something that I would recommend that people keep a bit of an eye on, on a plant-based diet, because if we are getting some of those more processed foods and things, and then they do tend to be, as, as you'll be aware for sure, but people probably watching this might not be, I think it's around 75% of our sodium intake actually comes from processed foods. So it's, it's not enough. I don't know anyone who's... Yeah, very little of it is actually what we're adding at the table or yeah. when we're cooking. Yeah. So if you're cooking mostly at home, um, you know, essentially you're 75% of the way there. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes, it's definitely something that we still need to be really mindful of and um, on, on a plant-based diet and, and when we're cooking and with the products that we're actually choosing. But I think on a whole food plant-based diet where you're preparing a meal from scratch, um, you're you're 75 percent of the way there already yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. do still need a little bit of salt um so yeah by making that switch you're already making a really positive move yeah um, exactly so so yeah so it's mostly with cardiovascular disease i mostly think of it as there's things that we avoid which i know is is not sort of the the positive way of thinking about it but it is you know reducing saturated fats particularly and that can even be you know, if you're having enough of them, that can even be from things like what we would normally consider to be healthy fats. Mm. And same with, you know, the the sodium intake. Um, those are probably the two the two main ones for cardiovascular risk. Mm. I think this link links in really nicely actually to another question that we've had pop up here. I don't know if you can see it down the bottom there, Luke. Oh, yeah. um, I can see it now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we managed to get the whole way through without anyone asking this kind of very controversial question. Um, and 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 that's 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 a great question. Thanks, Carl. It's it's uh, as as you as no doubt Carl will know, um, which I think is probably one of the reasons he's asking this question mm -hmm. is that Dr. Esselstyn is is really not a fan of any of these added fats, and I think. Mm. Sorry, just to go back one step, because I'm not oh, yeah. sure if everyone can see the comments. Um, so the, the question has been, as far as controlling reversing heart disease, how good or bad do you think nuts, seeds, avocado, et cetera are? Yeah. Um, so I, I think where I was going with that, again, it's, it's a cumulative risk thing. If we think about Dr. Esselstyn's patients, and that's, again, a good reason to watch Forks Over Knives, is you can see that these are sort of, almost like the walking dead. Um, so they were literally the only people that had no other options available to them that ended up going to see him. And so these are people in their 60s, 70s, even 80s, who throughout their lifetime have been doing the kinds of things that really damage their blood vessels and keep their cholesterol levels high. And so I think that's a really important factor to keep in mind. I would say that it's this is really a little bit of an individualized decision in some ways because it's a matter of what what level of risk are you okay with? What we know is is the like I've said multiple times now, the lower your cholesterol is for the longer period of time over your lifespan, the lower your risk is of any kind of these cardiovascular events because it simply can't happen without the cholesterol. And what we know from these foods is one of the reasons why Dr. Esselstyn doesn't like them is that despite the fact that they are um, otherwise have some, you know, nutrition involved in them, um, they still have saturated fat. And so what that means is that it's possible to overeat on these things and get so much saturated fat that your cholesterol levels don't come down. And Dr. Esselstyn does feel that they damage your endothelial cells regardless. And there's, that's, that's a very controversial statement at the moment. And I'm not particularly keen to go one way or the other on that at the moment. And I think we probably need more research on that. But I think if you were trying to be the safest you could, then you would probably want to limit those foods. Um, and you would also 
want to see, you know, what, what your sort of percentage of calories overall from fat is. And I think a lot of people will be surprised by this because we feel like um, it's just whenever I ask a patient, you know, how's your diet? And, they'll, you know, I'm seeing them because they have a problem that I know is due to their diet. They're like, oh, it's pretty good, really. And, and we just have no clue because none of us have the training that Fuchsia does where they can kind of calculate in their head how many calories this is, how many, how many grams of fat, you know, and how many, what percentage calories from fat that's going to be over a day. So what, I, what I've started doing for people, um, particularly those who are plant-based who, who come for consultations with me, is I say to them, hey, look, uh, you know, you, you're taking all this time, you're obviously interested um, to, to, to find out how you can improve your health, that you're going to um, see me for a consultation and invest some time and money in that. How about you invest some time just putting your, you know, your daily food record into an, an app like Chronometer? And what Chronometer is going to do is it, is it use, uses US nutrient values, as you'll know, Fuchsia. So it's not perfect for New yeah. Zealand, but it is... I quite often use is actually Easy Diet Diary. It's, oh. it, it actually uses New Zealand, uh, New Zealand and Australian uh, food databases to calculate that. So just if you are using Kiwi Foods, um, that is probably a, a slightly more accurate option. Having said that, um, Chronometer is used a bit more widely, so they've got a bigger range of foods on there. Um, but uh, yeah, you do have the option to input foods into Easy Diet Diary as well. Is that one free as well, Fuchsia? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah, and the cool. good thing about that one is if you're working with a dietitian, we can actually plug that into software and get more extensive information than what is shown in the app. Uh, so we can actually give you like a full nutrient breakdown, which is awesome. Really no, that's yeah. cool. And so, so, so anyway, well, I don't know about that one, but definitely what um, I imagine. Um, it will also do, but what chronometer will do is it will just give you, you don't want to look at the nutrients too much because that's where it's going to be a little bit off potentially. But if you look at your total, um, let's say if you look at your saturated fat intake, and if you look at your percentage of calories from each of the macronutrients, then, you know, if, if you've got a high cholesterol and your percentage of calories from fat is around 30%, then try getting bringing that down to maybe like 20% or something and, or, or 25% and seeing what that does to your cholesterol levels. And almost certainly, because you'll be reducing the amount of saturated fat, particularly when you're doing that, you're going to see a reduction. And so I think most people would be surprised. And, and it's again, it's, it's, this isn't a blaming thing, but it's just like if you go to a restaurant, it's a nice vegan restaurant, good chance what you're eating is going to be probably 40 to 50% calories from fat. And that's okay every now and then, potentially, if you don't have heart disease and so forth. Um, but yeah, m most people will be probably sitting around the same as the average New Zealander, which is around 30, 32% or, or thereabouts. So you're doing better with a plant-based diet, but you can, you can actually find out what you can do and get some control over that yourself. And so it might be that you are having too many avocados and nuts and seeds and all that kind of thing. And that one of the ways you can improve things as by, you know, replacing those um, with some other foods instead. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's really great. So thanks for that, Luke. Yeah, it's a very roundabout way of answering your question, Carl, but I don't mm. think we can say, you know, that these, I, I think we can certainly say that what Dr. Russelson says is no, um, and that the, the, the people in the world who have the, basically don't have heart disease tend to have a diet that, of course, includes, um, it's, not, it's not a plant-based diet, it's not a fully plant-based diet that these people have, but it does tend to be low in fat, and that, and that lends them to having a cholesterol that's low over their entire lifespan, and that's, that's probably what's, what's, um, what's making the difference for them. Mm, yeah, no, I think that's a very thorough answer, and I think it is absolutely a, a, a great area, so... Um what that looks like for each person may be slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, it looks like that was all of our questions for today. So unless there are any others that pop through. I just want to say a massive thank you uh, to Dr. Luke Wilson for taking the time out of your Sunday uh, to, to join us today and have this 
super important conversation. Um, I think I've certainly learned a lot just from this conversation and I'm sure the people that have joined in today uh, will have had a similar experience. Uh, you've explained things really well. So thank you so much for joining and, and sharing your expertise on this topic. No, that's cool. Thanks very much for the opportunity again. And obviously I've learned quite a lot too. So <laughs> I've got a different diet tool that I can recommend for people and yes, yeah, some other ideas I think have come out of this that's been really useful. So yeah yeah awesome and thanks everyone for joining in um, if you have any questions following on from today's session like you're welcome to flick either dr luke or myself a message through instagram and we will be happy to um happy to answer uh if you are feeling a little bit shy today um <laughs> Yeah, and I'll be posting the recording of this if you want to sort of watch it again, uh, just through Instagram as well. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we'll catch you again on um, the first Sunday of next month. Sounds good. Awesome. See you guys. Thank you so much. Bye.